So thank you, Dr. Koirala. And I'm sure like, you know, you have a lot of questions as Dr. Koirala said that he wanted questions from you. So, you know, please save that for uh, the talk after Matthew. Uh, so please, uh, Matthew, La, and a uh, couple of things I forgot uh, for Matthew's introduction, which uh, Dr. Koirala already said. He has many things, and it's all difficult to summarize in five minutes. I tried my best, but Matthew is here in front of us. So, you know, please go ahead, Matthew. So I'm sorry to stay seated. Is it okay for you? You, you, you want me to stand in the back? It's okay? The monks are quite lazy, and also I, I, if I make mistake, they can correct me if I'm nearby. So thank you so much, Dr. Samish. Thank you, Shalav. Um, you describe me as a, as a, you say you are a heart guy and brain guy. You know, I'm afraid my neuroscientist colleague told me that I had a brain, but they said there's nothing left in the right side and nothing right in the left side. <laughs> <laughs> so they say it's hopeless. <laughs> so anyway, it's good because my heart is still running. Okay. And I think, you know, um, good heart is, a, a, a good heart is also a healthy heart. A good heart in the sense of kindness, compassion, openness to others, less self-centeredness. You mentioned the study about aggressivity. Interestingly enough, there's also a study about analyzing the language of people. You know, how much they employ me, me, mine, etc. Uh, you know, compared to average people. And then they correlated that precisely with the uh, heart problem and other things. And those who are excessively self-centered, it also turned that they have more heart attacks and things like that. So of course, me, me, me also lead to aggressivity because if your world is uh, reduced to the bubble of, of, self, of self-centeredness and it's kind of stuffy in the bubble of the ego, you know. So that means the rest of the world is seen either as an instrument for the um, you know, achieving your self-centered goals or as a threat uh, to those goals. So you divide the world in attraction, repulsion, and completely centered upon yourself, which is very, not only unhealthy, but unrealistic because we are so deeply interconnected. And uh, so, first of all, you know, someone said, can we do a selfie? There's no self. So you do selfless selfie. How do you do that? <laughs> so anyway... So, if you look carefully according to Buddhist philosophy, uh, the mind or consciousness is a dynamic stream of experience. So, of course, there is a, a person that is our history, which is not the same. The, in the same way that there is the Ganga, is not the same as the Mississippi River. But there's no such thing as a little head popping up from time to time saying, you know, I'm the real Ganga, don't forget. So, there's no such thing. It's a dynamic stream. So, if we verify that, uh, as, as a me that is really the heart of my being, and then we divide me and the rest of the world and what is mine and everything. Um, many psychological studies have shown that this exacerbated self of a sense of self-importance actually doesn't bring happiness. You look for so-called hedonic happiness, I mean endless succession of pleasant sensation, which is a recipe for exhaustion, basically. <laughs> It doesn't work as happiness. And you fail, actually, to do so. That is, so many studies have shown that. While if you are left self-centered, I mean, if you really open your heart so that no one is left out of your heart, then this, you don't have also the sense of being vulnerable because you don't constantly try to protect yourself and see the world as a possible instrument for maximizing your personal preferences. And the world, the universe is not a mail order catalog for your desire and your fancies. And even it was so there's seven billion being used in the same catalog and they cannot, you know, the world cannot be what all they want it to be. So it simply doesn't work. Not only is it a very unpleasant situation, me, 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 all day long, but it assumes that you are a separate entity that we relate like uh, snooker balls that sometimes bump into each other. Uh, but we don't realize that this is bound to fail because it's at odds with reality. Reality is not made of separate entities. Even things are not as solidly existing as they seem. The eye is not a, such a solid thing as it seems, although we feel like that. And so if we base our reactions towards the world 
on this, it's not going to work. So it's frustration. Not only it makes you unhappy, but you make everyone unhappy. Now, if you realize the profound interconnectedness, the interdependence of everything, the fact that things relate, but they are not as solid as they seem, they are not made of separate entities, autonomous entities, then this is opening the, the door, or laying the foundation for compassion. Because you realize your common humanity, your common sentience even with 8 million other uh, species which are co-citizens in this world. We realize that deep within, when I wake up in the morning, I don't uh, wish, may I suffer the whole day and if possible my whole life. So then if you transport yourself, and it's not rocket science to look at others, just I might be confused and look for happiness in the wrong place and actually be addicted to the cause of suffering and it happens so often in life out of confusion and ignorance. But deep within, no one wants willingly to suffer for good. So if I acknowledge that in myself, then I say, okay, now what, is, what are the means to accumulate, to avoid what brings suffering and try to build up what brings well-being? And then if I value that, I'm concerned by that, I'm going to discriminate in my action, not harming others and so forth. Otherwise, as our teacher, the Rokin Moshe used to say, you can't keep your hand in the fire and hope not to be burned. So the law of cause and effect works in that way. So if you realize that, then others, in the same way, they don't want to suffer. So that's the basis of our common humanity, because then you can become concerned by others' fate. And then if you are concerned, you're going also to act in an ethical way that doesn't bring suffering, but bring happiness. So that is also why Sant Dalai Lama said, good heart, my religion is good heart. It, it could look like something very banal, but of course when someone like him who has an immense heart says that, it takes a, a very profound resonance. So there is a correlation between having good heart and a, a physical good heart, but you will notice that there's no such correlation with intelligence. Intelligence is ethically neutral. You know, those guys who did 9-11, they were very smart to do all that with a few razor blades and, and good planning. So a, an instrument can do a lot of good, in the case of human, more than any other species, immense good and also immense devastation. We have just have to see how a psychotic mind somewhere now is doing so incredible, ununderstandable suffering to poor people who never you know, there's no reason to do those wholesale massacres as it happened now in Ukraine and, and other places as well. So it's the mind, it's intelligence which has planned that. It's certainly not the heart, the good heart. So good heart as a uh, ethical value, intelligence doesn't. Like a hammer can be used to build or to break. So that's why it's so important that uh, the good heart is, is a question. Now, um, we may um, question, but I mean, I, I got a few uh, recently a question from, it's funny, it was, a, it was a photo exhibit. I didn't expect a question like that. But don't you lose hope in humanity? Because I'm doing a French, an exhibit in France about him to beauty, beauty of, of, of human, uh, spiritual beauty, which was some great masters and, you know, who embody uh, love and compassion, men and women. And human beauty, that the potential for kindness and goodness that we have, and the beauty of, the, of our environment, which uh, will, uh, if we are uh, in wonderment with our env natural environment, naturally we respect. We don't want to destroy what is, makes us in awe. If I found this flower beautiful, I'm not going just to next moment to trample on it. And so if we are concerned, we act to protect. So this is, in this. so they say, don't you lose hope in humanity with all what's happening and everything. So of course, terrible things happen in the past. They happen now. They always happen somewhere in the world. Sometimes this uh, madness is exacerbated and leads to sort of like a sudden increase in those suffering. But altogether, now, to, of course, to nowadays, we know exactly what happens any time in real time in the world. So now there is a especially grave crisis. But altogether, if we look and if we say that, most people think it's just completely naive and cuckoo. But there's a, 
uh, in Harvard uh, psychologist called Steven Pinker, he wrote a very well-documented book based on so many research about the decline of violence, it's called The Better Angels of, I think, of Our Nature in English. So he looked at all the numbers since, you know, throughout history. And clearly, although there are incredible tragedies, unexplainable, unexcusable, but violence has significantly diminished in the world as we promulgated human rights, women's rights, children's rights, abolition of tor torture, and so forth. And so even nothing is perfect yet. It's still slavery, there's still torture, but at least it's not supposed to be legal. Just to give you a quick example, because when he asked people himself, they, they just uh, they, they don't see the point. If you look at the rate of homicide in Europe, there were good data in the UK in the 14th century. It was about 100 homicides per year for 100,000 uh, persons. Now it's one average in Europe. So it's not 10 times less, 10% less, 30%, it's 100 times less. The average number of casualty in wars, whether it's civil wars, uh, any kinds of wars, so after the Second World War, has gone down 30 times over 60 years. Although there are things like Ukraine, the Iraq, Iran wars, and so forth. So there are many reasons for that. Democracy, I mean, mostly those wars are peop uh, with, by from nations who are not democratic. Democracy increases the role of, of women. It's very important, you know, if a woman has eight kids because she has no say about it, like in some places, then she also can't control them and the society is poor and there's increased violence. Uh, exchange, exchanging, is a, you know, in Europe in the, I think, still Middle Age, there was 500 small entities, you know, principalities, dukes, and so forth, and they all always fighting against each other, invading one then one year, then three years later, the other one will invade and they will burn the field, maim the peasants, all kinds of things. Constant violence, in fact. Now there is about 30 entities, mostly democratic, you know, very unlikely Belgium will go at war against Italy nowadays. So it has changed a lot for the good, exchanging. Before we didn't exchange so much for through the world. So it's, if you exchange with someone with mutual benefits, they better be alive. So all these things make that somehow violence has decreased. Now, that may say, okay, well, that's a view of things, although it's based on solid research. But also, if you look at children, and you know, your mission is to give children a new lease of life when their life is threatened because their most vital organ is not working properly. What better gift can you do uh, to someone who has a whole potential of life ahead of her or him than, you know, allow that potential to be expressed and that person to fulfill their aspiration for the happiness of also the parents and everyone. So that's to make a, a more happy society if when children pass away less. And this is about also uh, child and uh, mother and child mortality. You know, in Tibet where we're doing our programs, once we did a survey of 300 mothers of all ages. Of course, they have six, seven children, 80% of mothers had lost a child at some point in their life. I mean, not, not necessarily at birth. So it's still very prevalent. I don't know what's the rate in Nepal. So all these things are preventable, and anything we can do is that. But we may, childhood is a good place to, to see, you know, about the, the dispute about human nature. So are we, is human nature f uh, basically bad, as some philosopher like Hobbes and all that were thinking? It's only uh, the government and society who sort of control them so that they don't kill each other at all times. You know, Winston Churchill say history has been just a, a part of humanity at war against the other all through history. So is that the case? Or uh, as a social animal, or do we have a, a greater predisposition to appreciate uh, love and kindness and, and give it and cooperate. So you know, there have been theoricians saying that uh, we are little brute beasts early and then we sort of socialize. That was the view of Sigmund Freud, for instance. But scientific study, and that's where it become you know, interesting because you do study what, how the children behave and then you make conclusion out of it. So there's many uh, great researchers who did that, including 
in, Le in the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, uh, Warnecken and Tomasello, to just mention them, who study very young children from one year old to four. And then they first look at how cooperative they are. For instance, they would, uh, children would play in the room with or without their parents, and someone would be sitting on a stool and drop something, a pen. Uh, not intentionally, but uh, by accident. And you see that 90% of the kids, they drop what they do, even playing, and run towards picking up that and give it to the person. Even they, they, you put some obstacle, like balloons, they go over it or around it to do that. And if the guy throws it, they don't move. They, they really see that it, it needs help. So there are many experiments like that. And they even then did that with chimpanzees. So we also do that, you know, although they, <laughs> for instance, the two chimpanzees in two different cages, and one, uh, there's food there, so one chimpanzee could get it if the other one helped him with the mechanism, but the other one is not going to get the food. He's simply going to help his friend to get the food. So the other one is sort of, you know, they sort of bang a little bit and say, you know, do something, and then eventually they do it. And also you do something where they, they need to both pull a rope together to get food. You know, the tray comes to their cage. But on one of them, they fed him like anything uh, 10 minutes before. So he's not hungry at all. So he has no interest to pull the rope. But the other one is hungry and sees that, and he sort of says, hey, hey, pull the rope. <laughs> and he does it. So you see, so their, their conclusion was that it's already started for our common ancestor five million years ago, five million years ago. So there is a natural predisposition to cooperate. Until five years old, children are almost unconditionally cooperative. There's a great study done in Yale University where you, very small babies, you know, like eight months old or one year old, and you show them uh, a box and there is two puppets. One puppet is trying to open that box and doesn't succeed. Like said, a, a blue puppet. Then a yellow puppet come and help to open the box. Okay. Then you do the same thing, but in, instead of a blue, yellow puppet coming to help, a, a red puppet comes and when the box is half open, it slams it back. Okay. No, no, no nasty puppet. Then an experimenter who doesn't know which is what. So he doesn't sort of say, hey, you want this one, this is the good one. So the other experimenter doesn't know which is the good and bad puppet. Just show like that to the baby. You know, like one years old, he looks like this. And then 90% take the helping puppet. That means they, it's not towards them. The two people behaving nicely or not toward each other. And naturally, they prefer that. Now, with three months old babies, of course, they were not going to catch a puppet, but they see, they look where they, their gaze is going. Are they looking at the nice puppet or the nasty one? 90% again prefer, at three months old. So this is something that is not learned, that is not because of reward. It is something innate. So we can become psychopath, we can commit mass murder, genocide, all kinds of terrible things. But this is more like a deviation. So, you know, Anna Arendt spoke of the banality of evil, speaking of uh, Adolf Eichmann and other Nazis, who were seemingly ordinary bureaucrats and end up, you know, being the cause of the death of millions of people. But there's also, we could speak of banality of goodness, that is, most of the time, most of seven billion human beings behave decently with each other. And we don't notice because that's our baseline. This is our default mode. We don't, so, okay, let's make an experiment. Today, when you go out, are you going to congratulate yourself because nobody start, start punching each other? No, you are not. This is normal. Now, if two people start <laughs> punching each other, after one week, people will say, you know, this Dr. Corala and these funny monks were there speaking about altruism and good heart, and those two guys start bashing each other. <laughs> that will be the talk of the, <laughs> of the evening. That means it's a deviation. That's why we pay attention to it. That's why the media pays so much attention to it. 
because evolution has equipped us to react to some potential threat. If you hear a loud bang, you know, something happened, maybe dangerous. If two people fight, something terrible could happen. So we need to bring our attention on that. Otherwise, we, we relax. It means that you know, the media are so fascinated, and we also, by, by violence, that there's a distorted proportion of reporting on it. I remember once being called for, I don't know for which reason, to it's one French TV, and they said, OK, we are going to ask you to comment the first item of the news. So I, they gave me the list. I said, don't you have something nice that happened in the world? There's plenty. It was all catastrophe, murder, something, something, something. So we lose trust in human nature. So now to complete quickly with the children, because it's quite interesting. You may say, okay, now if they are so gullible, uh, you know, cooperative, you know, they are going to be exploited by others. So it's interesting that at five years old, when their emotional brain and sort of more cognitive control comes in, they start sort of discriminate between people who reciprocate, who behave nicely with them and others, and others. So they, they, they begin to say, okay, not everyone is a nice guy. I should be a little bit careful and protect myself and my dear ones. So you could say, well, that's a healthy re reaction, but it should not go too far either. Then because again, you my group, in group, out group, and then you start again making a big sort of, you know, uh, sort of, distance between you and others. So interestingly, there's a third age, briefly, I mean, this is such a nice story. Around 12 years old, then children again open in different way, a more abstract way. For instance, a, a group of school children could make, collect funds for kids in Afghanistan, even they do so in Europe. So they start thinking, not the child they have in front of them who suffers and they feel empathy, so all this needs to be known and also encouraged uh, so that children can bloom into good human beings so they, they can thrive in their own life and be good for society. So, um, yes, so you, know, you are trying to do that. We are trying to do that in Karuna just to very quickly, you know, we chatted as uh, my dear friend Shalav said 20 years ago, very small with Kempo, Ramjan Boshe, Raphael was here in Tibet and a few other friends. And it was very small. Um, you know, we were like, uh, you know, it was like the far west of the humanitarian. I mean, <laughs> not organized at all. <laughs> but gradually, now he kindly spoke about me giving 100% of my books, but that would definitely not be enough to what we do today, which is about, we help 400,000 people a, every year in different ways in India, Nepal, and a little bit in Tibet, and we start in France, and we have a few places elsewhere. So in the field of health, uh, education, social services, uh, trying to serve the most uh, impoverished people, uh, uh, populations, and also empowerment of women, very important. In India, we have a lot of uh, women, uh, adult alpha, uh, you know, literacy program, and, and, and also professional training. In India, over the last two years, we did 60,000 kitchen gardens, you know, they're monoculture, so uh, they buy f <laughs> their own food at the markets, which is ridiculous for farmers, so we give them different plants, and they grow their own vegetables, they exchange, so we do that in Nepal also in many ways. So this we try to help, and many other people fortunately join us, because I can't churn a book every week, and anyway, <laughs> I'm too old now to do that, but fortunately, it's going on. So that's a wonderful thing, and what we do, we see if we can find ways to cooperate. But to put that in action is very important. And I must say, in my personal life, you know, thanks to my great teachers, you know, Kansiri Moshi and others, uh, and the Dalai Lama, who always says, compassion, compassion, compassion. So truly, I, I felt how crucial and centered, central the, the notion of altruism and compassion is. But, it, and it's very wonderful to try to cultivate in, our, in your own heart. Because if we don't, then we have nothing to give. We are like a, a, a beggar who wants to give a banquet to 100 beggars. I mean, just what can he give or she give? So we need to have something to give if we want to do so. So we need to cultivate compassion in the first place. Uh, so uh, in a way, the best way to prepare for running an NGO would be maybe to do a retreat on growing compassion uh, seriously from the depth of our heart to magnify it. 
And it's not like bodybuilding, you know, there's a limit or jumping. You cannot jump five meters, you know, we don't 240 meters, but we'll never jump five meters. But why compassion should be limited? You know, why can't you double it or multiply almost infinitely? Because it's a qualitative state of mind. It has no bonds, only the bonds that you put. So when someone said, you know, the Buddhist idea of unconditional love is very unrealistic. I mean, uh, Jonathan Haig, which is a very well-known philosopher in, in the United States, said, this is crazy, you know, you should help your kids first, and all Dalai Lama's thing is just unrealistic. I said, look, it's not, you know, the guy who wakes up in the morning thinking I'm going to help all the world, I mean, it's, of course, he's going to calm down, I guess. But the point is not to leave anyone out of your heart. You know you are not going to be able to do so, but there's so many people who leave so many others out of their heart, and they discriminate for so many reasons based on anything you can imagine, religion, the, the creed, the age, sex, caste, whatever. And so they say, okay, I'm going to help those ones, but not those bad guys. So there's no such thing as bad guys, there's only people who are sort of sick in their mind and sick in their heart. You know, if you look at the, with the eye of a physician, if you see a dangerous, mad person, the, the, the psychiatrist is not going to take a, a big stick and bang on that person's head. He might control him for a while and then see, can I cure that person from that mad sickness or not? So with that idea, even a bloody dictator, you may see how can possibly on the short or the long term change that person or change the culture from which that person arose so seeing more like a healing uh, hate and healing all those things that are the cause of suffering. Compassion is not per se a moral judgment. Of course, ethic is a very important uh, um, affair. But compassion is more about remitting to the cause of suffering whatever they might be and wherever they are. So a bloody dictator, that's the one that is now in action, in a way, is a cause of immense suffering, so compassion is how can we remedy that suffering? Not by hate, but by trying to, all possible means to neutralize the violence if we can, but also remedy the causes that made that possible at all. It should not happen. That means something went wrong in education, in, in institution, in political system, that such person can gain such power with such a harmful mind. So this is where compassion can be applied to even the, the worst people we can imagine. I remember a French intellectual told me, your compassion, this is really so stupid. Look, those Tibetans who have compassion for the Chinese, this is stupid. I told him, this is not about that. This is about remedying to the cause of suffering. And even those who suffer, you know, in the, at the time of where there was labor, labor camps in Tibet, I, I remember the one of the physicians of the Dalai Lama, Tenzin Shotra, he said among his group of 60 people, five or 10 survive only. And he said in his case, and all those, if he had felt hate all the time for the people who were torturing him, he said he would not have survived. He said definitely. And those who had hate, they said they sort of faded away and died of famine and sickness and so forth. He said, I saw that there were young people indoctrinated, you know, brainwashed and all that. And I managed to feel some compassion. And he said, that saved me. So, okay, if you say that, you know, casually, you say, oh, easy for you, you know. But he, he went through that for so many years. And likewise, I met people who were tortured uh, in the Argentinian jail at the time of the generals. And, and one of my philosopher friends, Mikuel Benasayak, he was tortured a lot. And he said, Deep within, I kept my human dignity, and I never feel hate. I thought there was, was, uh, were mad people, and he said somehow that saved me. So that's, I think, to preserve our sanity. We need to keep that compassion and that good heart. So, you know, sorry, uh, in France they have something called the blah blah car. It's the, you know, the, you share car. So I'm the blah blah monk, so it's nonstop, so. <laughs> anyway, you talk of sustainable harmony, Maybe I say a few words because it's an interesting concept, although it didn't pick up very much. Once there was a <laughs> report on positive economy that was given to the French president, Francois Hollande, and somehow I was part of that, I don't know why. So I presented that concept, 
And François Hollande, oh, that's a very interesting concept, but then that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> he said, see you, see you soon. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think sustainable development, of course, is great, but we always feel it's quantitative development, you know, to, to do more. More, more of this, more of that. And we can't, because we don't have three planets, we don't have five planets. By August now, we have exhausted the renewable, par the renewable part of Earth resources. So this is untenable. We know more and more, and still we don't do by far what is necessary, out of difficulty for politicians to decide. So basically, this, the Winston Churchill said, uh, a politician looks for next election. Tomorrow we have something to do about that. And then a, a statement is looking at the next generation. So there is, it's, it's more than time to look at the next generation. It's almost late. I mean, all the scientists of the environment, and I know intimately quite a few of them, say we have six, seven years. And each time they, they say it's still possible, but we have six, seven years, and it need drastic change. So what the, what the politicians say is still possible. You see, it's possible. They say it's possible. But possible, yes, but at what cost? At changing dramatically the way we live. And that's usually they're not ready to do that. You know, so sustainable development has this little bit suspicious of quantitative. So sustainable harmony is basically the same, but is doing better with less. So the, it's called like a sort of, uh, you know, Happy simplicity or happy uh, being more content and having a better quality of life, not at the, in a sort of consumerism and, and materialistic way. There have been studies showing actually that the most consumer, consumption and materialistic minded people, there's been a 20 year study in the Rochester University, compared to the less sort of, you know, materialistic and cons cons consumerism-minded people. Those who are the most, 25% most uh, sort of what we call extrinsic values, you know, the, your, your car, the where your clothes look, your social status and all that. Usually they look for, again, hedonic happiness, you no know, pleasant sensation, and they start not so happy. They are less healthy because they tend to abuse of all kinds of things. Uh, they have a lot of social relations, but less real friends. They are less concerned about holistic uh, questions like, you know, poverty in the midst of plenty and uh, uh, the environment and world health and so forth. They are more obsessed with debt, strangely. So anyway, he said that Tim Kasser, who did this study, said, well, I'm not a moral uh, philosopher, but if you want to be happy, have good friends and, uh, you know, be concerned by the global issues and so forth, you better be like those who value more intrinsic value which is the quality of human relationship. That's one of the main factors of well-being, in fact. All the studies show that as well. Uh, you will be healthier, you will be happier, more like the, what the Greek call eudaimonia, which is a flour sense of flourishing and thriving, which is more not just like sensation. So, you know, there's all these things. If we were to do that, do better with less, uh, we can do it, but uh, we cannot skip on adding to our endless needs. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, this uh, sustainable harmony is to remain in harmony with nature instead of uh, using it in an unsustainable way. And it's also uh, sustainable harmony now is about remaining to social justice in the sense of poverty in the midst of plenty. You know, just to uh, say very quickly, the, the model of the homo economicus is to maximize personal preferences. So, and then so-called using the voice of reason. That's all the modern economy is based on that. But I have a friend called Dennis Noah, who is a great economist. He says the voice of reason alone cannot deal with two things. Poverty in the midst of plenty. You have reason as no reason. If you, reason cannot tell you if you are only interested in maximizing your interest to pay someone more with those t-shirts in Bangladesh that you sell in France or somewhere. It needs to care. And then, the problem of the common. Common is the environment, you know, democracy, advancement of science. You have to step out of maximizing your personal interests. So he said we need the voice of care. So, and then if we do so, then social harmony and sustainable harmony. So in a way, just to conclude my blah blah talk, I came to really be 
intimately convinced, both at the light of Buddhist teaching, at the light of examples like uh, Dr. Korala and others, like my dear friend Dr. Ruit and others, that benevolence, I mean, having more consideration for others, altruism, is really the most pragmatic answer to the challenges of the 21st century. So briefly, today we have a difficulty to reconcile the three time scale, the short term. You know, someone needs a heart operation. A mother in, in somewhere in South India or in the Terai needs to feed her kids for the next week and she doesn't have what it takes. Or economies to do this super fast investment now in New Jersey where every second they do millions of transactions, it's completely crazy. And also the looking at the return at the end of the month. So that's the short term. So then you have the you have to reconcile that with the midterm. Midterm is a, a lifetime or a career, a family, 20 years, a generation. And what is the main that we, thing we are looking for? Somehow to flourish in life. We need to uh, fulfill our natural aspiration for well-being, happiness, for having a good life. If a, a, a country is the most powerful and the richest, everyone is feeling miserable, what's the point? So that, uh, of course, needs to take in consideration in, in everything we do, in the way we organize work, uh, transport, uh, social fabric, and so forth. And then there's a new challenge that we didn't have 10,000 years ago. There were only five million people on Earth. And that challenge is now we are the main force that shapes uh, the future of our planet. Now, when we are five million, that much we could do. Now we are seven billion. Our power has increased exponentially. Before we had things that we could throw. Now we have, you know, atomic power, electricity, fossil fuels, all kinds of things, the internet. So our power has been magnified perhaps billion fold, but our care has not been magnified to the same extent. So that unbalance, we did a meeting in Brussels with the Dalai Lama Mind and Life Institute called Power and Care. How to rebalance that? How to, ins to bring care in power to make it a, a force for good? So in the long term, having more consideration for others demands that we care for future generation. Otherwise, they'll say, you knew or you did nothing. And their fate is in our hands today. So if we are selfish, there's no environment problem because we won't be there in, in 100 years. You know, my favorite Marxist is Groucho Marx. I don't know who knows Groucho Marx. But he said, why should I care for future generation? What did they do for me? <laughs> But I heard Stephen Forbes, an American billionaire, saying the same thing on Fox News seriously. He was told about the rise of the, water, of the oceans that will bring catastrophes in 100 years. He said literally, and I listened again and I noted down, I find it absurd to change my behavior today for something that happened 100 years. So that guy's probably, uh, I guess he has no kids or he doesn't care for their children. So basically, and I think one of the great environment scientists said, yes, it is an altruism question, the question of the environment. So you see, if you want to bring it on the same table, scientists, doctors, politicians, uh, men of science who studied environment, social workers, people who are involved day to day in relieving suffering, they need to have a common concept to make a better world together, except a few nuts like some we see today. Most people want a better world, but they need a concept to work together, to, to unite those three time scale. And selfishness is not going to do the job. You are going to magnify your, your, re, your returns now. You are going to be selfish all the way, and you don't care for future generation. So more consideration for others. You go towards social justice. You remedy to poverty in the midst of plenty. You have a, a, an economy with solidarity, with care, Caring economics, we also did a, a Mind and Life meeting in Zurich on caring economics. There's a book about that. In the, in the midterm, you will make sure that the conditions of life are allow for thriving. You know, once I was in a business school somewhere in Brussels, and they said, well, you know, the role of government is not to make people altruistic and happy. I said, no, of course, but at least to have the, the structure and the the way that it, people can do it without being 
completely invaded by the free riders, you know, who dominate the ultra an economy without any regulation. Always the free rider, you know, rule the rule the game. So people who trust each other, they have no chance. So there's all kinds of things that we can do so that people do thrive and that people can cooperate because other studies have shown that most people are ready to cooperate if they trust each other. So trust has been going down in many countries. So all these things can be done in the midterm. And in the long term, having more consideration for others is the only practical answer to make sure that our future generation will not inherit a completely damaged environment and suffer tremendously. You know, if we go to the worst prediction, and is there, we are not so close to going to there, three degrees, four degrees, it's an entirely different planet. Population could be reduced to one billion, which we say, well, that will take care of overpopulation, but at the cost of how much suffering? You know, in Europe, they are all crazy about the migrants and so forth. 250 million climate migrants might come by uh, 30, 20, 30 years if we go that way. So it's nothing co to compare with what's happening now. If you look at the COVID, you know, all the, sorry <laughs> to, go, to go on, uh, all the, the various uh, uh, last 20, 30 years, all the viral problems all came to the same way. I mean, same origin unhealthy relation with other species and nature. If you look at Ebola, uh, AIDS, they came from you know, encroaching on natural environment in Africa and so forth, chimpanzees and others. Then uh, you know, the SARS, the avian flu, porcine flu, the COVID, not the COVID, but the others, mostly came from you know, this uh, uh, industrial farming, where we have 100,000 chicken in a place ruled by 20 people, so it cannot be healthy. So all these, uh, the, uh, sort of unbalanced relation with other species brought most of those viral epidemics of the last 20 years. Though. So all these things are warning signs uh, that we should really re-equilibrate and go towards more altruism. So it's not a, a luxury, it's not an utopia, it's a very pragmatic concept. Maybe it won't work, there are a lot of contrary forces, but it's up to us after all, isn't it? So, sorry to take so much time. Thank you.